for organizing this for us. Um, so just to get started, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping on our side too as well, uh, before we start talking about the, uh, uh, or get into the presentation itself, is that, um, you know, how we're going to present the topic today of bringing transactionality to the streaming ecosystem is really to talk about a specific use case and then relate that to the evolution that has happened through the uh, the streaming e ecosystem and, and the different architectures that exist out there today. So, because um, it's always best to really understand it from a uh, an actual implementation and usage of the system. So that's why uh, uh, Raja from Alpaca has joined us today. Uh, he's going to be talking about their order management system and the journey that they've taken from going from their initial implementation of the order management system to a, a version built on top of a streaming system uh, that is you know, giving them uh, a, a, you know, a, a huge amount of performance benefits and things from that perspective. So Raj is gonna take us through um, their, uh, their, their initial implementation of their order management system. I will then uh, talk a bit about the different streaming architectures that we see out there today and that we commonly see across a number of different environments. I'll then also be talking about Red Panda itself, which is a streaming platform that's really focused on low latency transactional type workloads. And then I'll hand it back over to Raja to talk about their order management system that they built on top of Red Panda. And then he'll be giving us some uh, real performance results that, uh, that they've seen with this new architecture. And then we'll open it up for questions and answers after that. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to, to Raja to start talking about Alpaca. Thank you, Roko. And thank you to the Linux Foundation for uh, hosting this session as well. So just to start off, I just want to explain a little bit about what Alpaca is. So Alpaca is an API first um, stock and crypto brokerage platform and trading platform. In late 2018, we started off with a trading API, which allowed um, people to trade programmatically via a RESTful interface. Um, to date, we've raised just a little over 70 million in, in funding. We uh, trade uh, a few billion dollars per month or a couple hundred million dollars per day currently, and that's been growing at a very uh, steep rate. Um, it's entirely commission free. And, and really what we're here to do is provide uh, ability to empower developers, no matter where you are in the world with really easy and friction free access to all uh, financial markets. And in the near future, we'll be expanding past US equities and crypto into other asset classes as well. So at the heart of a brokerage or a trading platform, there's the order management system. Basically anything that touches a trade or touches an order passes through the order management system. It's um, primarily responsible for validating the order, ensuring that the account state uh, aligns with the order, um, and then finally getting the order to market or routing the order to market. We, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we are currently trading billions of dollars a month per, per the system and it, and it continues to scale. So one of the most important things, especially for a, a programmatic trading application, um, and, and we have a very large algorithmic trading user base as well, is the processing time. So the, the quicker that we can process each order, um, the better it is for our customers and the data backs that up. Uh, the reason why that's important is that a lot of trades or orders are very time sensitive in nature as the price of the market moves. So if, if someone is algorithmically algorithmically uh, placing 1000 orders at a time, if it's taking a very long duration, by the time they get to the back of the, the queue of their orders, it, they might've missed the mark on what they're trying to trade at. So processing time is, is a huge paramount. So to, to um, step back bef and, and just level set on the previous order management system, um, I just want to explain exactly what we were working with. And truthfully, the, the first version worked act pretty well, but we knew that we could do better. So the, the, the V1 of our order management system was essentially a singleton. We happened to be a Go shop. So the way that we built our order management system, we would spin up a, a Go routine per account. And that uh, Go routine would handle the orders on a per account basis. Now, this worked 
fairly well and truthfully scaled pretty well, but it didn't quite have the throughput nor the reliability that we were looking for. So one, it was a single point of failure. It was a single uh, application running on a single pod. Um, so if there was any sort of, of failure, we'd actually have quite a big delay in the time it took to, to restart the service. Um, secondly, the state lived within uh, a relational database as well as some other services. So often for each order, for all these validations that we had to do, we were um, performing several network round trips. And finally, uh, we noticed a lot of contention, especially at high uh, times of volatility, such as the market open, where a significant amount of the trading volume happens within the first 30 minutes. Um, we were just he hitting some of the uh, contention at what RabbitMQ's throughput was able to do as well. Our P95 for this system was around 150 milliseconds, but sometimes during extremely heavy volatility, such as uh, a week like we're having this week in the market, we would see uh, the, the response duration as high as 500 milliseconds or more. So, thanks so much, Raja, for, for that initial overview of you know, your first approaches to the order management system. And you could think of this as being sort of a, a, a very simplified diagram of that type of approach, which is you know, something that's been common for quite some time, which is that you have an application that is uh, you know, open either via API or, or other services to a set of users. And then you're pushing this data into an MQ system or enterprise service bus. Uh, things like Tibco, uh, MuleSoft, Enterprise Service Bus uh, were pretty common. RabbitMQ is still very common. Things like ActiveMQ too as well. Um, and then you know th this was really beneficial because you could easily then link it into a number of different services behind the scenes. So you can push data to a transactional database to have sort of your current state of what the system looks like. You could also push it to a data warehouse to have your sort of change log of all the things that occurred for a customer uh, or kind of a, a, you know, a change history for everything. And then you could also link in other different services as well. And, you know, this was a, a, a nice or kind of that first sort of step of like decoupling services and having a service oriented architecture that we've heard, uh, you know, from some time back. The challenge with that architecture, though, was that it didn't scale just to the, you know, to the same point that uh, Raja was talking about is that, you know, once you do sort of hit the, the maximum throughput that you can do in a single instance of a system like that, you have to start thinking about sharding and then you have to, you know, do a lot of that management yourself. It becomes very cumbersome to actually work with that type of system. So what most people have moved to, and Raja, I think you guys even looked at this at one point in time as well, using a, a database as sort of the front end, uh, you know, or, or kind of like the main sort of source of record uh, for your system too, as well. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, we, we, we did explore the change data capture pattern, but ultimately it wasn't performant enough. Yeah. And, you know, we see this quite often as well, where you know, because of the challenges that we've seen with these types of MQ systems when they hit a certain level of scale is that, you know, the first approach or kind of the next approach that people uh, lean towards is using a database as a replacement for the queue. And, you know, it can definitely be done. Uh, there's ways to work around it. There's different design patterns that can work. But ultimately, uh, you know, these, these systems are really only meant to kept, keep sort of the current state of the, uh, of the system itself. And actually keeping changes can be, you know, pretty burdensome for these types of systems. Uh, and also it, it becomes very really challenging trying to implement a queue in a system where you need to be able to have indexes and other things from that standpoint. Uh, I've worked with a number of databases myself in the past and the number of times I've seen somebody put an index on a last modified column uh, or created at column. Um, you know, I, I've seen it too often to count. And you know, th those are really big bottlenecks uh, in performance for these types of systems, unless you're hashing uh, that particular index or you create a hash index on it. But then if you're doing a hash index, you're very likely going to have to talk to a large number of nodes to be able to do any type of uh, you know, ordering on, you know, based on that index as well. So uh, it can be done, but it you know, definitely has some drawbacks. And then still even taking that approach, you still want to have a log of all the changes that have occurred and also to create actionable events from that data. 
And to do that, you have to use another piece of software, a change data capture software like Debezium, and some databases have this built in, to push the data to a streaming platform uh, like Kafka. And I put Kafka here because it's sort of the, the most prevalent streaming platform that's out there today. And you know, there are a few different alternatives out there like Pulsar, uh, NAT, and other things. But you know, Kafka does make up the larger majority of the market in this regard. Um, so you have change data capture uh, going into something like Kafka, and then you have a number of systems off of that pulling data to either you know, fill in a data lake, maybe you have some stream processing happening. You might even have other services that are taking actions uh, from that data uh, at, you know, as that comes in. Maybe they're uh, you know, uh, executing other services or updating other systems or calling other like partner APIs or other things from that perspective. So you know, this is the kind of uh, current state of what most solutions look like today. And you might ask yourself, well, why can't we just take Kafka and sort of replace uh, in what we saw in our previous slide, the MQ system, the enterprise service bus, why can't we just replace that with Kafka and you know, kind of call it a day? And to really understand why that isn't an approach that is gonna work for most people, you really have to understand the assumptions in which Kafka was built upon. And uh, to understand those assumptions, we have to really look at the history of Kafka. And so to look at the history of Kafka, you know, we have to um, look back in when it was first developed. It was developed at LinkedIn. Uh, the first release uh, came out in 2011. And it was initially really focused on shipping logs from web servers to a Hadoop cluster. And, you know, you probably updated it or you probably put it in a Hadoop cluster and you were doing Hive queries on top of it. And you know, those Hive queries would run for 12 hours or for however long that they would take. Um, so, as you can imagine, you know, latency wasn't super critical for these types of use cases and throughput was much more critical. Uh, you had a huge amount of logs and you needed to get them to this large centralized system. So, you know, for that, they really focused on building the system with throughput in mind and not so much latency. And then also, you know, if we look back at 2011 and, you know, we'll, we'll take a quick look at like what the state of the art, you know, state of the art uh, systems looked like back then. Um, they also had to work around the hardware that was available to them. So one of the ways they did that um, was by using something called the page cache. The page cache is a, uh, something that's provided by the Linux operating system that allows you to cache files into memory um, outside of the actual process itself. And this made a lot of sense for Kafka back then. It was definitely a, a good choice for them to make because running a Java process with more than 16 gigs of, uh, of memory or 32 gigs of memory was probably not advisable because you could have large garbage collection pauses occur within the system. So trying to keep the heap size of your Java application small in Kafka's built on Java uh, was actually you know, critical uh, for back then. So being able to actually give off the, or you know, give the responsibility for caching data to the, the Linux kernel uh, and the Linux uh, OS made a lot of sense. The challenges with that though, is that you don't get a lot of control over how data gets flushed to disk. Uh, you can specifically tell it to sync to disk, but Linux or Kafka by default would just allow the page cache to flush on its own uh, default schedule, which is you know, currently today in most operating systems, 10% of system memory becoming dirty before you start flushing to disk. So this could be a lot of data that sits in memory that's not actually persisted to disk quite yet. And that made a lot of sense when you were running on you know, fairly slow spinning disks uh, that didn't have a huge amount of IOPS or throughput available. So this is why they delayed writes to disk by default because then they could actually have larger block sizes. So you could you know, write 128 kilobyte block of data to disk and not have to you know, try to do like 16 kilobyte blocks or four, uh, four kilobyte blocks to disk. It's uh, Kafka has, uh, is mostly written in Scala on top of the JVM uh, and has used external systems for consensus. So uh, it uses a Zookeeper, uh, which a lot of projects have relied upon Zookeeper for external consensus. And Kafka is you know, a great example of that, where they keep a lot of uh, cluster state information and also um, you know, use it for consensus and, and membership, uh, you know, membership coordination of the cluster too as well. 
So let's talk about what, you know, what did the hardware look like back in 2011? What was sort of state of the art back then? And it's always interesting to like go back and look at the Wayback Machine. And, you know, I actually went to like Dell's Wayback uh, or to the Wayback Machine and looked at Dell's website just to, it, it was a little bit of nostalgia to see, you know, what was actually available. And this was the typical machine that was recommended for running uh, map reduced type workloads and also Kafka clusters typically. And as you can see, you know, this is a system that can handle, you know, at most uh, 12 cores. Um, you know, you, you most likely probably were running with eight cores at the time. And then uh, you were most likely running with a larger number of, you know, two and a half inch or three and a half inch SATA drives running at 7,200 RPMs. And just to give you an idea of what the performance of that looks like, down below, you can see what the, the right performance looks like uh, for mixed and sequential workloads. So, you know, sequentially, I could write at about 82 megabytes per second. And in a uh, non-sequential write, I could do it at about one megabyte per second. So, you know, doing things or, or caching data into memory and then doing sequential writes of large blocks of data made a lot of sense for this type of workload that exists or for this type of hardware that existed. Uh, back then. But things have changed dramatically. Um, you know, we don't normally go to Dell's website and look at what type of hardware that they have available today. We're going to the different cloud providers and looking at the instance types that they can provide us. So for AWS, you know, they just recently announced some of their Graviton 2 instances that are, you know, uh, very impressive uh, from their overall performance and price standpoint where I can easily get something with 32 cores uh, or 32 vCPUs and uh, the ability to write four gigabytes per second and also have a 50 gigabit connection link. You know, the other thing that I didn't really highlight in that previous state of the art for 2011 is that you were typically running with a one gigabit connection for your network. So, you know, your network was typically a very big limiter back then, whereas today, you know, you can see here, I can get a, you know, if you want to go for the larger instances, you can absolutely get 100 gigabits per second, which is absolutely amazing in comparison to where uh, the networking technology was 10 years ago. And the same is true for Google Cloud, uh, where I can actually have local NVMe storage that can handle millions of IOPS uh, and also allow me to, uh, you know, do writes of nearly four and a half gigabytes per second uh, to those, uh, to those disks. So, you know, uh, we've come a huge way in just a very short period of time. So what does it mean to take advantage of this modern hardware that we have available today? Um, what we've seen in, you know, building these distributed type systems uh, is that workloads are becoming much more bound by CPU than disk. You know, as we just, just saw, like we can have millions of IOPS, network has gone, you know, drastically better. But what hasn't really improved dramatically is the speed of a processor or speed of a, a core itself. Um, you know, we don't have uh, 12 gigahertz processors and things from that perspective, but what we do have is, you know, 32 core, 64 core, you know, upwards of 200 core machines. And really just, you know, we become much more bound on that CPU and focused much more on parallelizing processes versus, you know, really focused on the fast single process. And with these types of this type of architecture, um, you know, there come other issues with it. So, namely, one of them is going across NUMA domains. Uh, you know, when I have a large number of cores or different number of or a large number of sockets, I have different uh, memory access paths to uh, the actual memory on the system. And going across that path um, from uh, from one core to the other can be quite costly. So, you know, if your process can be aware of where memory sits and where it gets executed, this can be a much uh, or a large, you know, a, a great advantage to you. So you don't do these sort of high latency type requests to access that memory. Also to make use of these systems, you know, kind of the traditional way that you would uh, make use of them. And, and this is a way that you know, a system like Kafka works today is that you have a large number of thread pools. So if you want to take use of a, or make use of a very large machine, you have to specify that you have, you know, 16 threads that are just doing network I.O., 16 threads that are doing disk I.O., 
uh, maybe you have 16 threads that are doing uh, you know, other sort of client operation IO2 as well. And very quickly, you have a large number of uh, different thread pools and different threads that are trying to be uh, scheduled on these cores. So this can lead to more context switching, uh, which then adds to overall latency on the system as well. And then uh, the other thing is that you know, file systems or newer file systems have definitely come into their own. You know, back in 2011, most people were running on EXT3 file systems. You know, nowadays, EXT4 is pretty prevalent. XFS is become very prevalent as well. Uh, and XFS provides us a, a number of advantages, specifically the ability to do out of order uh, direct memory access rights and also adaptive F allocation, which uh, these are both things that uh, I'll talk or you know the, the system we're going to talk about here in a little bit, take advantage of because it allows us to uh, be much more um, performant and allow us to you know not have to wait for uh, you know file allocations to occur or to keep things completely sequential across different partitions within the system as well. So let's talk about systems that can take advantage of this modern hardware. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, th there's a, a framework that exists out there called CSTAR. This is actually used by a few different projects out there today. Uh, it's completely written in C++. And it's really focused on making use of uh, you know, these larger machines and, and really actually sort of treating these larger boxes or, or the machines that we see today as if they were a distributed system in of themselves. And so what that really means is that you know, looking at a core as if it was a single uh, machine in a cluster of machines and you know, act, uh, operating with that sort of assumption so what it actually brings to the table is really the ability to do a lot of async programming uh, via different futures and promises, um, requires no locks and minimizes IO blocking. Uh, you know, some, que some questions that we get sometimes is, you know, well, when, you know, does C-Star make use of like IO urine and things from that perspective? It doesn't today. And we don't expect that, you know, it, it, there is a work or an, a, sort of a, a thought to port it over to IO urine but that's probably only gonna give us about a 5% performance benefit where um, you know, since we're completely asynchronous already with this type of system, you know, there's not gonna be a huge benefit versus a, you know, a system that's much more synchronous in nature to begin with. We also have a thread per core architecture, which what CSTAR does is that uh, when it first starts up, it looks to see how many cores do I have available? It launches that many threads and then pins those threads to given cores. This really reduces all, you know, the majority of the context switching happening in the system. And it also allows us to preserve the cache lines in, in the system too as well, because those cores typically have different, you know, L1, L2 caches as, attached to them or uh, that are assigned to them. And this allows us to stay on a given core so that we don't have to, uh, you know, refill or kind of refresh a, a different cache line when we do get switched or if you, you know, if a thread does get switched to a different core as well, it allows us to also be very, you know, by nature, NUMA aware because uh, we can be very specific on the memory that we uh, work with for that given core. So with all that, um, let's talk about a streaming platform that's actually built to make use of this modern hardware and is built on CSTAR. And that is Red Panda. Um, Red Panda is written completely in C++, makes use of the C star library at the core, really focused on a high throughput, low latency, uh, and providing strong transactional guarantees. And what that really means is, you know, we are persisting to disk after every batch of messages that comes into the system. So we're not doing, uh, you know, we're not uh, delaying writes or anything from that perspective. You know, data gets persisted the moment it comes into the system. Uh, it's also, uh, in a provided in a single binary. So uh, it includes the broker, an HTTP proxy, and a schema registry all together. These are typically things that are separate components in something like Kafka, where you'd have to run Kafka, you'd have to run Zookeeper, you'd run an HTTP proxy, and also a schema registry um, to really get the same level of functionality as you get with a single binary in this regard. It's source available, uh, everything's out on GitHub and you can actually uh, take a look at the issues and, and features that are being developed on at the moment. And it's fully Kafka compatible. Um, 
uh, you know, so you can make use of all the different sort of projects and, and you know, things that are available in the ecosystem today. And, you know, Raja, I think that was like a main driver for you guys uh, looking at Red Panda was the Kafka API and the single binary, right? Exactly. I've had previous experience with Kafka and, and Kafka in production is a beast all its own. Um, what we found with Red Panda was a just the, the zero friction aspect of it. So we had a very small and diligent engineering team that was able to get started and get something into production relatively quickly. And since it's been in production, it's really been pain free. So that was a, a huge adoption uh, metric for us. So that, that's that's always great to hear versus the uh, versus the opposite. So, um, no, and and this is definitely this was one of the main reasons why Red Panda wanted to focus on the Kafka API is that, um, you know, although there's probably simpler APIs that are uh, exist out there today, like Nats comes to mind, um, you know, it is kind of been picked as the standard. It's the VHS versus Betamax debate pretty much, and. I, uh, you know, being able to have that API compatibility allows for all the different client drivers that exist out there today to be used and uh, allows it to be plugged into anything that supports the Kafka API uh, seamlessly as well. We've really focused on the performance safety aspect, which we'll talk about in a, sen uh, a second. And then there's no external dependency. So uh, Raft is actually used for all consensus internally to the system. Uh, it's used for the cluster state and all the data within the cluster as well. So let's talk a little bit about Raft because like we're talking about modern hardware, but we should also talk about modern approaches to consensus. Um, you know, Zookeeper and etcd, well, etcd is Raft based in many ways, but uh, it's, you know, Zookeeper was sort of before Raft was prevalent. Um, and you know, Raft has sort of taken over as kind of the consensus protocol of choice as sort of a simplified version of Paxos. Um, you know, uh, as Raft, uh, you know, does have a few sort of requirements around it. You have to have odd number of replicas. Uh, you know, each partition inside of Red Panda. So in you know, inside of both Kafka and Red Panda, you have a topic, and a topic is made up of partitions. And within those partitions, you have guaranteed ordering within those partitions. And that you know, that partition can be any sort of uh, key space that you define, uh, or it can provide a default key space for you. So in the implementation for Red Panda, each partition is its own Raft group, which this gives us a lot of flexibility to move leadership around and to uh, you know, move replicas around on the system. We don't rely upon anything externally because everything is done inside. So this makes it uh, a single fault domain for us. So we don't have to worry about multiple distributed uh, um, uh, system protocols that exist out there today. You don't have to worry about like your Zookeeper connection and your Kafka broker connections or other things from that standpoint. And this also allows you to write out slowness in individual replicas. So if a leader uh, can act to just a majority of the different replicas, you can make forward progress. So if one replica is a bit slow, uh, you know that isn't going to stop you from being able to re uh, reply to a given client in the system. So all of that, what does that lead to? Um, well, you know, it, this is some benchmarking that we did earlier this year, and uh, we'll actually post in the chat a blog post uh, that highlights sort of our, our methodology for this. We actually use the open message benchmark tooling, which is actually a Linux foundation uh, project um, to actually do this benchmarking. So uh, against Kafka and Red Panda. And what this particular example is here is this is doing 500 megabytes per second on a three node cluster inside of AWS using the i3EN six extra large instances, which provide us guaranteed networking. And we went with the six extra large instances because of the guaranteed networking. Um, if anyone's kind of been familiar with AWS, uh, if it says up to 25 gigabits per second, it means you actually get that for about eight minutes and then you get throttled to eight gigabits per second. So there's a lot of nuances that go into this and we highlight that through the blog posts as we you know, sort of discovered that for ourselves as well. And what this workload shows is this is an end-to-end -end latency in the system. Um, and we were telling Kafka to actually persist to disk after every batch of messages. Uh, so you can see that the average latency there is about 14 milliseconds and for Red Panda, it's a little over two milliseconds. But what the more interesting part is around the uh, actual tell latencies. And this is the part that becomes really important for transactional systems and, and systems like the order management system is that 
when we start going out to the, the 99.9 or 99.999 latencies, we can see that Red Panda stays very consistent at about 120, 150 milliseconds. Uh, whereas Kafka goes out to about three seconds at these max latencies. So you know, because of this, a lot of people over provision instances for Kafka to reduce these, uh, the effects of these tail latencies. And that you know, really creates large clusters with underutilization in general. So bringing it full circle, you know, uh, technology itself is, is pretty cyclical in nature. And this is, uh, you know, this is an exempt from that particular uh, you know, uh, uh, trend that we see. Whereas now we can actually go back and put something like Red Panda that can provide this low latency transactionality uh, in a, uh, you know, within the streaming ec ecosystem for these types of use cases like the order management system that Alpaca has built. So you know, now we can have our application talk directly to Red Panda and now we can feed into our different you know, uh, databases that exist out there, the different data warehouses or data lakes, and also the different microservices that exist out there today. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back over to Raja. Thanks again, Roko. Um, so just building on what Roko stated in, in the previous slides, we really evaluated a lot of different uh, ways to approach this problem. Um, we sort of set a very high bar for ourselves. So when we, we started this project on, on reevaluating our architecture of order management system, our goal was to bring that uh, P95 from 150 milliseconds down to five milliseconds. The other big goal was the throughput. So we wanted to be able to handle around $10 billion in, in trading activity. Um, and, and those were just synthetic goals that we set based on um, the growth of our business. But I'll walk you through sort of how we approached the problem, how Red Panda, Panda played a part in that, and then what some of the numbers. By the way, if you're interested more about the design and the implementation of our OMS, we've also created a blog post that walks through the, the major aspects of it, as well as some of the throughput. So um, Red, uh, the OMS itself is entirely in memory and uh, horizontally uh, scalable. So you can have multiple shards of the OMS system that are running. It's uh, the, each OMS is responsible for a subset of our total accounts and it handles the, all the, the state in, me in memory itself, including things like the positions or uh, the details around the equity or buying power that are required. Um, in order for this to be durable, we need to persist this data somewhere and we need it to persist very quickly and also be able to consume it very quickly. So that's where Red Panda comes in for the write ahead log. Um, when an OMS starts up, it uh, basically rebuilds its state, the, the memory state from uh, the Red Panda topic and then it, its ability to, to start working. So in the event of a failure, another pod will come back up read from the Red Panda right ahead log and uh, it'll be active again. Another really happy side effect of decoupling um, the wall and, and building this into our system was that we have a lot of other services that would love to be aware and to be able to observe the state of trade events or order events. And having that wall live within a streaming engine like Red Panda makes it so that other consumers can simply subscribe to that uh, wall as well. So here's a high level architecture of our order management system. Um, we basically, a, a customer or an order comes in via one of our API services. So at Alpaca, we have uh, a few different APIs. We have a live trading API, a paper trading API, a broker API, and then finally a market data API. So if it's an order related event or request, it go, connects to our order management system over gRPC. Um, and it, at the top of our order management system, we have scalable balancers. So they're horizontally scalable as well. You can think of these as sort of an Oracle. So they uh, abstract away the order management system and its implementation details away from the consumers so that they're sort of act as the Oracle and they'll route the right um, request to the right OMS. The OMS them themselves, like I said before, uh, keeps everything in memory, but it's persisting its transaction log to uh, a streaming engine and we're using Red Panda here. We also have the happy benefit where we can consume that wall 
and that lives within this, the streaming engine and persist it back into uh, the relational database in the same way that what it was propagating before, meaning that the applications don't necessarily need to be aware that there was a, a system change in place. On the other side of what happens with the order, so once an order gets processed, we communicate to the market. So mo most of our infrastructure is in GCP, yet we have uh, infrastructure in uh, Secaucus, New Jersey at Equinix Data Center. And we have an interconnect from GCP to our trade execution rack at uh, Secaucus. And then from Secaucus, we have cross connects, fiber cross connects uh, directly to a variety of execution gateways, depending on the, the asset type. So that's uh, gen generally how our, our OMS works. And these were the results we saw. So these are actual um, results from our production environment. So uh, the, the version of the OMS that this replaced, like I said before, had P95 or around 150 milliseconds, but was really not deterministic by any nature. During high volatility, we saw you know, very erratic um, and concerning performance behavior. Now with uh, OMS v2, which is in memory and uh, a wall powered by Red Panda, we see extremely deterministic performance, even at extremely high load and a P95 of around 1.5 milliseconds. So way under what are our, our super uh, aggressive benchmarks of five milliseconds. And again, this is a synthetic benchmark, but uh, when we were evaluating our, our system before going into production, we just wanted to see how fast we could push it. Now, there's no way with our previous system that we would even be able to come close. And truthfully, we didn't decide to push it even further than this because these results were just outstanding. So um, the test scenario was uh, 100,000 uh, accounts concurrently sending 10 orders each. They, all happened to be a market order. So they didn't uh, have a price determined by a limit. Um, they were randomized symbols and uh, these are actually just a reworked Grafana um, dashboard. So this was uh, sampling every 30 seconds. And the Red Panda cluster was just three nodes. Um, a few things about the Red Panda cluster. So uh, relatively recent Linux kernel, almost no tuning on, on the kernel, and then almost no tuning in the Red Panda configuration. It was really just provision, uh, set it up, and, and away we went. Um, and here's the results we received. So again, the P95 well under two and a half milliseconds, and uh, we were able to process just under 1.7 million orders a minute. The latency was, we didn't really experience great tail latency. It was great to see deterministic latency. And as I mentioned before, very easy to scale out. So as we require more throughput, we're hitting actual per node um, constraints. We can just scale out in a horizontal fashion. And, and just to touch upon the uh, no kernel tuning, uh, that was actually, uh, that's something that Red Panda just does automatically. So uh, this was one of the great things that, uh, you know, Raja and team were able to take advantage of is that when you install Red Panda, the first thing it does is set a number of different uh, kernel parameters to just make that very automatic for you. So um, when we launched this, we sort of started rolling this out gradually, but the feedback, and I'm not gonna go through it, um, just came in unsolicited. The, the, one of the patterns that we saw that we didn't anticipate was some of our algorithmic community. We saw their volume of trade volume pretty much double or triple overnight. Um, so it's been a game changer, not just for us in terms of our ability to, to, to scale Alpaca, uh, but also it's been a, a phenomenal performance improvement that's had great financial and material impact to our user base. Uh, thank you so much, Raja. Um, you know, a, a few things uh, just before we uh, start answering some of the questions that have been asked is, um, you know, you can go and check out the source code for Red Panda. Uh, the link here is, you know, from on GitHub. We have a blog post that talks in, about a number of different things. We have uh, one that's in there that's great that talks about the different uh, chaos testing that we do um, on top of the system. We actually uh, are currently working with the Jepson team to uh, to do a, a, a full sort of Jepson test or, or sort of uh, you know, a correctness test on top of Red Panda right now that we'll be releasing pretty soon. Uh, we have a community Slack channel if you uh, would like to engage with us or ask us further questions. Uh, and also I know uh, Raja Alpaca has a few things for you guys to 
to you also share as well. Yeah, I, I would encourage anyone that's interested in our trading API or our brokerage API. So if you want to incorporate uh, financial market access into an already existing product, we have an API for that as well. Then most importantly, especially for this audience, we're always hiring. So if, if what we spoke about is of interest, or if you want to be working with Red Panda, um, please either email careers at alpaca.markets or our job board, as well as our Slack community and our user base um, are posted in this slide as well. And finally, if you need to reach out, please reach out via Twitter. Uh, Alpaca is available at, at Alpaca HQ, and I'm personally available at Raja. Perfect. Yeah. So um, opening it up to a few of the questions that we've received. Uh, the first one was, can one consider Red Panda as a real replacement for Kafka in terms of guarantees, like exactly one semantics required for Kafka stream commits to source offsets and target topic? Are these uh, are there features where you don't have parity with the current Kafka versions? So um, for the first part of the question, uh, you absolutely can uh, you know see it as a full Kafka replacement. We do support the full transactions API. So, uh, uh, you know, Alpaca is actually making use of item producers, uh, which allows for you know, much higher throughput on the system as well. Uh, and we do support the full transaction side of things. So it works with Kafka streams out of the box. There are some things uh, around the full parity of Kafka, uh, for Kafka that we don't have. Um, and those things are, are things that we're working on to be addressed, like follower reads for replicas and, and a few other things uh, that are much more specific to that. But the large majority of the Kafka API is implemented. So I think that and also the Flex protocol, the newer version of the Flex protocol for Kafka, uh, we don't fully support. Um, and that's more just from a standpoint that we haven't seen a huge amount of usage uh, for that quite yet. The second question is, uh, does Red Panda also implement the Kafka admin API? And yes, yes, it does implement the Kafka admin API. So uh, you can set ACLs, uh, you can uh, do all the topic administration, you can use tools like Cal or Kminion or you know, a, a number of other of those types of systems right on directly on top of Red Panda. Uh, and they work on Red Panda just exactly as you would expect them to uh, with Kafka as well. Uh, one question for Alpaca is, you know, how long did it take you to develop the order management system V2? Uh, you know, what, what did that, uh, what did the timeline for that look like? Yeah, so we, we started looking at this in the, the second quarter of this year, and uh, we started skunking it out with one uh, of our uh, most talented engineers at Alpaca. And basically, he, he, we gave him the, the freedom to explore the space. We introduced him to Red Panda. We were able to get this into production in, in four or five months. And a lot of that was just experimentation. So as we're now adopting Red Panda in other aspects of our application, we're finding that it's almost, uh, you know, it can be a, a lot of implementation could be done in a week or two, given the complexity of the order management system and the in-memory aspect. That took a little bit more time than we anticipated, but it's worked out really, really well for us and our, and our user base. Well, I, I don't see uh, any other further questions. So if there's any last minute questions that people want to get in, we'll just give it a couple seconds. Um, otherwise, uh, I, I think that's all we had from our side. So uh, if you do have any further questions, uh, you know, we have both of the different Slack channels uh, listed here. You know, please do join us. We're always happy to help. Um, and you know, there's a, a multitude of different ways to make use of Red Panda and also Alpaca as well. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Raja, for, uh, for taking the time today. And thank you for the Linux Foundation for, for hosting us. Yes, thank absolutely. Thank you both um, for being here and for speaking on these topics. And uh, thank you to all our participants who joined us today. As a reminder, this recording will be on our YouTube page later today. And we hope to see you back at future webinars. Have a wonderful day, everyone.